Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. We welcome back to Central Assembly, Pastor Evangelist Mike Stottlemyre. Praise the Lord. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to see you all out there this morning. Amen. Uh, we just had a, we've had a great time. I don't know if you haven't had an opportunity to make it to the revival services. You missed it, but thank God it's online. Amen. Uh, but listen, you guys have a great pastor. You have a great uh, first lady and, and their daughter. We had some time to fellowship with them the other night. And we've, we've known each other for years. Actually, I preached here a long time time ago, it was, I think, when your first, I don't know if you remember, it was like your, your first time that you were here, I preached here one time, and when I first started preaching, I was thinking about this today, I just started preaching, my dad uh, used to do tent revivals and set up his tents, and I just started evangelizing, and I remember, I don't know if Pastor Doug remembers it or not, but I, I set up an appointment with him, and we I came in and I talked to him, and I was telling him, I'm just getting ready to start preaching, and I don't really know what to do or which way to go, and he was giving me some advice, do you remember that? Nope. Well, it happened. It would happen. I was there. Amen. I was there. So, uh, but it, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord. And I'm telling you, we've, we've had just an awesome presence and I can sense and feel the presence of the Lord here this morning. And come on. And I'm telling you, I wouldn't give you a nickel for a church service that he wasn't there. If he's not there, we might as well just all stay home. But this morning I sense and feel the presence of the Lord in the sanctuary this morning. I think y'all just lift your hands up real quick and just thank him for a moment that he would take the time to show up and be in a service where we are. Come on, Lord, we thank you. I thank you for your presence. Lord, in you we live and we move and we have our being. We thank you that in the midst of everything that you're doing around the world, Lord, that you would take the time to show up in this place this morning that we could sense and feel the manifestation of your glory. And Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for the atmosphere of worship, Lord, as we have entered in this morning. Lord, now I pray that our hearts would be ready to receive the word because it's the word that changes us. It's the word that equips us. It's the word that allows us to produce fruit in our lives. And we thank you for that this morning. And we give you all the glory and the praise and the honor in Jesus name. Everybody shout amen and amen. Hallelujah. Uh, real quick before we get started, once again, thank you all. Thank you for coming out for the, the revival. Thank you for coming out this morning. The hospitality, taking care of us, room, those of you that have sowed into the ministry, thank you for that. You all have been a great blessing. We came to be a blessing here, but you all have been a blessing to us. I want to thank my wife for being here with me this morning. All the kids went back home. I miss them, but they have to take care of our music at our church this morning. I wish they were here with us, but how many believe that the first lady did a pl plenty good job this morning? Amen. She's anointed. She can sing. Amen. All right, let's just get into the word. I'm not very good at preliminaries. We have somebody that does that for us. Amen. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I'm actually, I'm not preaching the message that I preached on Friday, but I'm kind of preaching from that same theme. I don't know. When I was trying to get the mind of the Lord of what to preach this morning, I just kept, the Holy Spirit just kept going back to me about that. I preached on Friday. Um, about that there has to be 
pain before there's going to be power. And this morning, I'm, I'm not preaching that same message. It's different. But it's kind of going along those same themes that something has to break. Is there anybody that could agree with me that if you're looking at all the things that are going on in the United States and around the world and even in our communities, that something has got to break? There has got to be some kind of a breaking, some type of a breakthrough, because it just seems like things are messed up. Do I, is there anybody in agreement with me that things are just messed up that we are I think we're starting to come to the realization that uh, the normal will probably never what we consider to be normal will probably never exist again just when we felt like we was getting a little bit of normal now we watch television and realize things aren't normal like they used to be and I just really believe with all my heart over the past two years a lot of the things that have been going on that in our churches in our communities in our own individual lives something has got to break and I believe God wants to do that. How many say amen? Mark chapter 6, when you get there, shout amen. I told you all through revival, I am an uh, audience participation preacher. I, if you want to shout, go ahead and do it. If you want to get out of here by 12, which pastor said last night that you all like to get out of here by 12, the best thing to do is shout with me. It gets me preaching fast. I get tired, wear out, and close the service. Amen? Sweat starts gone. I get tired. I'm getting older. I'm a little bigger than I used to be, and I wear out fast. But now if you all just sit back there, I can come down and hit a pace and preach for hours. All your food will get cold. You'll be the last one in the parking lot wherever you're going to eat. How many say amen? Uh, so how many going to shout with me? Amen? All right. Mark chapter 6. Are you there? And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent and his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat but he answered and said to them you give them something to eat and they said to him shall we go and buy 200 denarii or 200 days worth of bread and give them something to eat and he said to them how many loaves do you have go and see and when they had found out they said five loaves and two fish and he commanded them that they would sit them down in groups on the green grass. They sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves. Gave them to his disciples and set before them the two fish and he divided among them all. And so they ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments of fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. I mean, I know I've already prayed, but let's just pray one more time for the blessing of the word today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have that we can be part of what you're already doing in this ministry. God, how this ministry is impacting its community. And, Father, I thank you for the man of God that declares the word here. For, Lord, I understand. I can sense this is a word church. Lord, a lot of churches are built on everything else. But I thank God that this body is built on the word. And, Father, I pray that now, even this morning, that you would remove every hindrance, that you would open up our hearts and minds, that we might receive the word that it might produce in us, in some 30, in some 60, and in some a hundredfold. And Father, we thank you that we are receiving those that no matter where we are, that there is always more. And Lord, I pray that today that this word would equip us and encourage us and direct us in the path that you have for us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. I'm going to preach on the subject this morning that something has got to break. There's no doubt over the past two years in our nation and, and, and really around the world that we have dealt with historic. I mean, it has been like unprecedented the things that have happened in our nation. I mean, we have a, even right now in our nation, there's fires going on so bad out on the West Coast that we're getting smoke on the East Coast. 
Uh, I mean, we've got fires. We've got pandemics. I mean, everybody has been locked down at least in some way. Rather, it's just wearing a mask or, or locked down. Some people have lost, sat back and watched their life dream. Businesses that they started. I know in our community, there's a lot of small little mom Paul restaurants that people started years ago. But now they're shut down and probably will never reopen again. There are many churches that have went throughout the pandemic. And, and, and I know, thank God, uh, at least in West Virginia, we didn't have as bad a lockdowns as some places did. I mean, we kind of live in our own little bubble up there. We're already social distanced before we start. Amen. Huh? So we didn't have a lot of the lockdowns as much as everybody else did. But do you know in our nation that there are many churches that could not stay afloat and to this day probably will never come back, that they will cease to exist because of pandemics and because, I mean, we saw that the markets going up and down. We saw people lose their jobs and businesses. And listen, not only that, can you imagine the, the effect that the last two years has had on people's faith? I talked about a little bit the other day or, or the other night that, that of the effect that it has on people's faith when what's going on in your reality does not line up with what's going on in your mind and in your heart and what you read in the word of God. It's like you know that God is your healer and he took the stripes on your back for healing and you know that he took away the curse of the law and death and sin and death and you know the principles that healing is for us but yet you have a loved one on a ventilator and then you're not sure that they're going to make it or you believe in and trust in God for their healing and end up at their funeral. Sometimes it's hard. Come on, somebody preach with me. It's hard to be able to deal with that because you know he's your healer and you prayed and you had faith and you thought you did everything right yet it did not manifest with the results that you want. It can become damaging to people's faith. When you have a business and you started the business and you trusted God with it and you paid your tithes out of it and you sowed into the ministry and for years you counted it a privilege that you could sow into the ministry and help build pavilions and remodel and do whatever else needs to be done and now this business that you was trusting God to take care of now has went under and you can't afford to make ends meet. Come on somebody, that is damaging to your faith. That hurts your faith. Whenever you, you a job that you've had and you, you stood up and testified in church, thank God he gave me this job and I've got insurance and all this kind of stuff. And now the job that you thank God for, they said, hey, we can't make it. We're going to have to shut down. You become a consequence of that. There's so much that has been going on in our nation. We've, we've not only this, but even as pastor has already talked about, in the midst of all the things that have been going on, alcohol and drug abuse has skyrocketed. Huh? I, I just preached about it that mental, in our church, mental illness uh, right now is skyrocketing. Uh, the, this one article that I read that I quoted in our, in our service is that this one particular group that does mental health surveys, that there are more people right now, especially young people between the ages of 11 and 17 that think about hurting themselves or killing themselves than at any other time since they began to keep record of it. That is the, 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 the plight that we find ourselves in. And I believe, just like your pastor said today, the only hope for this nation is that God sent a revival that would shake us. But you know where revival has to start? It has to start in the house of God. How will we ever reach a community with the fire of God if our lamps have grown dim and we have grown cold and indifferent? Can I tell you that tonight or this morning that what we need is an old-fashioned hope Holy Ghost, heaven sent revival that will change our hearts and change our minds and allow us to become a light in a dark land. Uh, something has got to break. How damaging it is to our faith when we pray prayers and it seems like they have gone unheard. Is there anybody experienced that? Uh, anybody prayed and you just thought, man, God's not hearing my prayers. Huh. It can it it hurts your faith. I'm, am I preaching to myself this morning? Anybody else in here know what I'm talking about? 
Anybody else has had your faith that got hit hard at times when you were praying and believing and expecting and had faith and said all the right things and quoted all the right scriptures and yet it felt like your prayers were going unanswered. I believe in the midst of all this that we have to realize that something has to break. I don't know about you, but I still believe it, and I guess it is debatable, but I still believe that this is a generation that will still see a last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I believe that. Amen? If Jesus comes back and we haven't experienced it, I'll just say I missed it. But I still expect an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I believe every generation has had God place his mark on it and place his finger on it. But this is a generation for the first time in history. I was reading a Pew Research and it said for the first time in history, less than 50% of Americans claim to be part of a religion or part of a church. Like 48%. And then you say, well, what does that mean? All you have to do is watch your television. Because when you have less than half of the country that's going to church and part of a religion, you're not hearing things like turn the other cheek and pray for those that despitefully use you and blessed are the peacemakers. And because of that, we now have riots in our streets and they burn down buildings and people are unruly and there's no faith and there's no hope and there's no trust in a God because half of our nation is not serving him and allowing his word to get penetrated in their hearts we are seeing the seed of that coming to fruition in our nation uh, I'm trying to get to my text I believe that something has to break here in this text Jesus was speaking to a multitude of people and when he saw them he described them as sheep not having a shepherd when sheep don't have a shepherd, they are open prey to the adversary. They have no protection. When sheep have no shepherd, once they eat all the pasture that they have, they'll stay there till they starve because they don't have a shepherd that will lead them to shady green pastures. They will, they will not be able to get water because they need a shepherd that will lead them to steal waters. Are you here with me today? And Jesus looked at this group of people and he said they are like a sheep without shepherd. They, they are just milling around doing their own thing. The Bible talks about it, I believe, in the book of Judges. It says that because there was no king, because there was no authority, that people did that which was right in their own eyes. Can I tell you today uh, that I believe that paints a picture of the plight in America, that many people are like sheep without a shepherd, that they're wondering what to do, and they're thirsty, and they're dry, and they're hungry, and they're looking for God to do something. And I believe with all my heart that God wants to do something, that something uh, is on the precipice of breaking in America. You say, well, what did Jesus do when he saw them as a sheep without a shepherd? The Bible says in verse 34 that he began to teach them many things. Listen, I'll let you know there's nothing like the word of God. Amen? There's nothing like the word of God that will feed us and equip us and direct us and push us into the destiny that he has prepared for each and every one of us. Amen? Huh? I thank God for worship. I love worship. I'm a musician. All my kids are, are musicians. My wife sings. I mean, we. I've grown up playing the bass since I was old enough just to, to walk. But as soon as I was old enough to walk, my dad was putting the bass in my hand. But I thank God for worship. But can I tell you that worship is not what's going to bring you through hell in your life? Thank God for worship. Thank God because it brings us into the presence of God. But I can tell you what the body of Christ needs. It needs the word because the word, and listen, you can get people to worship, but it's hard to get people to get tuned in and keyed in to try to come out to Bible study or try to find the rich depths and nuggets of the word of God. But can I tell you that that's exactly what you and I need because it's the word that gives us strength. It's the word that equips us. It's the word that gives us a sword of the spirit wherein we can fight against our adversary somebody say amen when Jesus fought the enemy he fought him with the word 
Amen. He fought him with the word. The devil said here, this is what's going on. Jesus came back. It is written. This is what God has to say about it. If you want to be able to fight the adversary, it comes through the word. And I pray that this morning that you and I will be able to get this word in us so that something can break. I found out that you are only going to go as far as the word that you have. If I never preach to you about healing, how will you ever be healed? If nobody ever preaches to you about salvation, how will you be saved? If nobody ever preaches to you about giving and receiving a harvest, how will you ever know? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you and I don't receive the word or even if it's preached, but yet we're not paying attention and we're counting the lights and the chandeliers and looking at the flags and trying to figure out why so-and-so would wear something like that. I just can't believe she would just wear something like that to church right in front of everybody. Didn't she look in the mirror before she walked out? And the preacher's up here preaching and sweats flying and all this kind of stuff. But yet we're not hearing the word. We're not receiving it. The word, come on, it's the word that when we receive it, that now we'll be able to have faith on the subject. Now I can, so in other words, I can be limited by the word that I don't have. Some people say what you don't know won't hurt you. I won't let you know that's the biggest lie the devil ever told you. What you don't know is exactly what's hurting you. Because listen, you will be limited. If nobody ever preaches to you about healing, how will you be healed? If nobody ever preaches to you about deliverance, how will you ever be delivered? It takes the word so you can get faith hold on it so that now it can come to fruition in your life look here at the word in verse uh, chapter 6 verse 35 we're talking about something has got to break. And I'll let you know that in this parable, that or in this story that Jesus is recorded in the Gospels about how he broke the bread and the fish and multiplied, he performed an awesome miracle in their lives. But I believe that there's some principles in this word that will allow some miracles to come to fruition in our lives. In Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 35, he says the day was far spent. His disciples came to him, said this is a deserted place and already the hour is late. Can I tell you that anytime God starts to move in your life, usually it's in a dry, empty place whenever it's already too late. God has a reputation of waiting till things die and showing up. It, come on, somebody preach with me now. Uh, waiting till things die in your life and then showing up and resurrect what you consider to be dead. I know a God that sometimes will allow marriages to die and then show in and resurrect them. He allowed Lazarus to die when he could have saved him, but he showed up four days late so that he could bring resurrection power. If you're in here today and you say, Pastor Mike, the situation I'm in has grown dim and I feel like my marriage has died. I feel like my relationship is dead. I feel like this problem in my life is dead. I feel like my ministry is dead. Can I encourage you that now you are a candidate for a miracle because God takes dead things and he speaks life in them again somebody shout amen there, that, it's God's creative word when God speaks things they come back into order the Bible says that God cannot lie it does not mean that he chooses to have a higher standard of morality in which he cannot lie it means he literally cannot lie because his words are creative if God said that the sky is purple he's not lying at the moment that God said it every atom every neutron every cell everything in existence the universe would step into order at his word and the sky would become purple if God says you're healed your body has to be healed Every cell, every capillary, every, every abnormal cell, every cancer cell has to die. Every good cell has to live. If God said it, if he spoke it, his word is creative. Things come into order. God said, let there be light. And at 186,000 miles per second, light became. 
God's word is creative. That's why the devil don't want you to hear God's word because God's word takes people like a Gideon that said you're the least of your father's house and he says I'll make you a mighty man of valor. Come on somebody. He'll take an Abraham who was raised up in a pagan society and his daddy made idols and he said I'm going to make a new nation out of you. Come on. And I feel all the nations of the world are going to be blessed because of you not because of the texture of his skin or the collar of his hair. It was because of a spoken word that God spoke into his life. Can I tell you that when God speaks into your life, he'll change you. Thank God for the day that he spoke into my life and it changed me. He says this is a deserted place and it's too late. Send them away that they can go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, shall we go out and buy 200 denarii, which was the day's wages, worth of bread, and give them something to eat? But he said, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And they found out that they said he had five loaves and two fish. I want to give you one quick point here. God's not going to bless you with what you don't have. God's going to always bless you with what you do have. God's never concerned about what you lost. He's always concerned about what you have left. Because God will take what you have left and he will bless you with it. Whenever the little woman came to the prophet and said, my husband's gone, my sons are gone, we don't have money, they're going to come by and take them into slavery, what am I going to do? The prophet didn't say, I'll come down here and sit down here beside me and tell me, tell me about it. Tell me about how all the mean people are treating you. No, you know what he did? He said, what do you got left? He said, all right, if I come down here, I'm making you all nervous. I've got antibodies. I've got the antibodies. I'll try to stay at least six feet away from you. Amen? Huh? He didn't come and say, what did you lose? He asked her, what do you have left? She said, well, I got a little bit of oil. Huh, come on. He said, that's all you need. He said, I, God's not going to bless you. Come on, somebody. God's not going to bless you with what you lost. He's going to bless you with what you have left. And I found out that in today's society, we spend so much time crying about what we lost. And we spend so much time about who's not here. And we spend so time about what's not working. And what were the casualties of the warfare that we've been in that we forget that God's not worried about. You think it surprises God what's left in your life? You think it surprises God the relationships that have been broken in your life? You think it surprises God the people that have left you and went someplace else it doesn't surprise God whatsoever he's not sitting up in heaven on the throne trying to figure out now what he's going to do in your life he's not worried about what you lost he's worried about what you have left God will always bless you through what you have don't ever spend all your time come on I, I'm just learning that I'm starting to get a few gray hair in my beard and I'm learning stuff I never chase problems Amen. At our church, I can preach that because I'm not at our church today. At our church, if you gave me problems and you decided to go to another church, God bless you. We love you. Maybe come back and see us revival. Just don't stay. Amen. Huh. Now, if you got hurt and there was something that I can help fix it or something like that, I'm going to go for it. But if you, I don't chase problems. Amen. And then I'll start praying for the pastor at the church you're going to. And I'm like, God, please. I almost want to call him and warn him like, ha ha. I just want to let you know somebody came over there. You want to keep an eye on him. Huh? Isn't it good to be an evangelist? I can preach about all kinds of stuff. Huh? Amen. God doesn't bless you through what you lost. God blesses you through what you have. He told the disciples, he said, what do you have? They said, we've got five loaves and two fish. Can I tell you that a lot of times what you have to you doesn't seem like it's enough. 
this is, I'm not preaching any deep word this morning. This is Sunday school material. God always will bless you through what you have left. God always blesses you. Whenever the woman needed the oil, God said, uh, go, go get as many pots as you can and fill them up. The little woman that was making her last little meal for her kids, the prophet didn't say, I know we've been having a huge famine. What's, what, what all have you lost? He said, what do you have left? She said, I got a little bit of meal in a barrel, a little bit of oil in a cruise. He said, that's what God's going to use to bless you. I encourage you this morning to start taking a look around at what you you have left uh, and I will let you know but sow into it push into it uh, put some time into it uh, because that is the very thing that God is going to use to bless you many times when we look at what we have left it doesn't seem like much has anybody ever took inventory in your life and realized that what I have doesn't look like enough Anybody ever want to pay your bills and realize that what you had in the bank account wasn't enough? What would five loaves of fish, five loaves of bread and two fish, what kind of impact could that have whatsoever on 5,000 men, including women and children, not including women and children? Huh? Can I tell you that God has a habit of using people and things that nobody else thinks is enough. I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but I want to encourage you that David, think about this, David, his own daddy didn't think he was enough. Samuel called Jesse and said, I'm going to choose a king. The next king of Israel is going to come out of your house. Jesse called all of his sons in, except David. He ain't going to be David. Look at these guys. These guys look like kings. They're tall, good looking, handsome. They act like kings. They have a kingly demeanor. David, he's just Rudy, shepherd boy. He's never going to be king. Huh? David, while we're having this little banquet and the prophet's coming over to the house, would you mind just taking care of the sheep for us? Can I tell you that what, huh, what men think is not enough, God thinks is more than enough? Huh, you know the story. huh? The prophet went down through all the sons of Jesse. And he said, this, even the Bible says that when Samuel saw one of the sons, he said, that has got to be the next king of Israel. He looks like it. But when he went up, the Holy Spirit did not give him the release to pour the oil. And when it was all said and done, he looked back over at Jesse and said, do you have another son? Said, I do, but he's not good enough. I do, but I didn't even call him to the party. He said, go get him. They went and got the little shepherd boy, and when he come walking up the sideway, walk, the spirit came down on Samuel and said, that's the next king of Israel because he's a man after my own heart. Can I tell you, people might not think that you're enough. Ministers might not think that you're enough. Your family might not think that you're enough. They might think you don't have enough money or you grew up on the wrong side of the tracks or the color of your skin's not right but can I tell you that God looks past the outside and looks at the inside and God takes what's not enough and makes it more than enough somebody shout amen Moses had a speech impediment when God picks somebody to be his voice piece his mouthpiece he picks a guy with a speech impediment are you kidding me? You're going to make this guy stand up in front of the president and be your voice and say what you said with a speech impediment. I'm not making fun of anybody. Let my people go. You know how humiliating that probably had to be? If I was going to pick somebody to be my voice, I would have picked somebody that was a great speaker, that was an orator, somebody that could put phrases together and move a crowd. 
I would have picked somebody that could speak, but when God picked somebody to go to the president of the greatest dynasty and nation on the earth, the greatest empire on the earth, he picked somebody with a speech impediment that probably nobody else would have picked. But he said, you know what? I'll use you. I'll take what's not enough in your life. Can I tell you, you might have weaknesses and nobody else would pick you. Whenever you look at yourself, you might say, nobody would pick me. I used to be an addict. I used to be an alcoholic. I've done things. I've been places I shouldn't have been. Nobody's going to ever be able to use anybody like me. I don't have the right last name. I wasn't one of the best ones. I was the black sheet of the family, so to speak but can I tell you that God looks beyond all that and with men it seems impossible but with God there's nothing impossible and he'll do it in your life I'm not going to take it I could preach the rest of this sermon about that Peter had a bad temper and a cussing problem you imagine that another cussing preacher he had a bad temper and a cussing problem I wouldn't have picked him amen I would have picked somebody that had it together and could at least control himself enough not to be used in slang words in front of people. Amen? But God didn't. He said, I'm going to use you. And he stood up on the day of Pentecost and began to preach. And the church began to be multiplied to. And when it was all said and done, he said, Peter, on the revelation that you have that I'm the Christ, I'm going to build my church on it. And the gates of hell shall not be able to prevail against it. Don't spend so much time looking at your weakness uh, that you forget that God's not. God knew you had weaknesses when he created you. He knew all about you. He knew your problems. He knew you had a bad temper he knew you slipped a cuss word out once in a while but he still picked you he still chose you he still called you hello that must have been good you must have a lot of cussing people around here they're like yeah praise God praise God I didn't get any more shouts like that than this whole revival start talking about people cussing and they're like yes God can still use me. Praise God. Hallelujah. You with me? You know the point. God takes what you don't think to be enough. and He does more than enough with it. If I was God, I wouldn't have picked me. If I was God, I wouldn't have chose me. But I'm glad that he did. If I was God, I would not have chose me to stand behind this pulpit and preach his word to you this morning, but thank God that he did. I don't know why he did, but I'm excited that he did. Amen? Huh? He took what wasn't enough. Listen, he'll take what's not enough in your life. He'll make it more than enough. God takes things that you won't even, people don't even count. Look here with me. In Mark chapter 6, verse 44, he says those who were eating the loaves were about 5,000 men. But in in the gospel of John, the same story, we find out where the five, it just talks about here in Mark that they had five loaves and two fish. It doesn't really say where it came from. But in John's gospel, it says, and there was a lad there who had five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? So here was a young lad that wasn't even counted in the number. They said 5,000 men. They didn't count the women and children. But yet a child is the one that had the five loaves and two fish that God was going to do the multitude in, going to feed the multitude. Have you ever been counted out by anybody? Have anybody ever looked at you and said you'll never be able to do it? You'll never be anything? Has anybody ever looked at you and said you didn't have enough faith? Has anybody ever said I can't count on that person? Can I tell you that's the kind of people that God's looking for? God's looking for people. Listen, I'm not negating that you shouldn't be faithful and you shouldn't strive for excellence and you know, all those types of things. I'm not giving you a means to go ahead and just be half-hearted in your serving God, but I'm trying to tell you that God's not looking for perfect people, that God takes his people that mess
mess up, people that nobody else counted, people that nobody else thought would amount to anything, people that nobody else thought would be good at anything. Why? Because when you're anointed by God, he takes less and does more with it. Amen? Huh? God took this little boy that nobody even counted. He wasn't even worthy to be counted. And he said, I'm going to take what you have and I'm going to feed a multitude. I'm going to do a miracle that's going to be recorded and throughout the, all the gospels and throughout the annals of time. I'm going to take what's not enough and was not counted and I'm going to do something awesome out of it. I'm going to do something great out of it. Somebody say amen. Huh? I want you to get out of this point this morning that no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what people think about you, no matter what your reputation is, that does not deter God. God looks beyond all that and says, I can do something with you. Can I tell you that that's why I believe Jesus came as a carpenter? Because carpenters look at things different. Most people look out in their yard and they see a pile of wood and a bunch of shingles and a bunch of bolts and screws and they say, that's what I have. I have a pile wood a bunch of bolts and screws and shingles but a carpenter looks at it and says I've got a house there I've got a building there I've got a church there that's why Jesus I believe came as a carpenter because he doesn't look at what I am he looks at what he can do with me come on somebody he looks at me and says I don't care what you are right now if you'll give me what you have I can do something awesome with it if you'll be willing to trust me with your life I'll do exceedingly and abundantly above anything you can ask or think. In verse 41, it says that when he had taken the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves. Blessed and broke the loaves. It don't even sound right. How can you be blessed and broke. I don't even seem like that. That uh, maybe, maybe Mark messed up. They don't even. They. I mean, they're like on opposite ends of the spectrum. Have you ever heard somebody say, "I'm blessed and broke"? Amen. You can't be blessed and broke. That sounds weird. Huh. I'm blessed. I just lost my job today. <laughs> Unless you didn't like your job. I've had a few jobs that I was glad when, they, when I left. It was a blessing. I was like, thank God. Amen? <laughs> blessed and broke. It almost sounds funny. How can you be blessed and be broken? It seems like you would almost have to be one or the other. That you could either have to be blessed or you have to be broken. How can you be blessed and be broken at the same time? It would seem like in our way of thinking that you would either have to be one or the other. But can I tell you that when it comes to Jesus, that being blessed and being broken is intertwined. When God decides to bless you, he will always break you. Can I tell you that the bread could not have been used until it was broken? If I had five loaves of bread and I was going to give everybody, we were going to have communion service in here today, it would have done me no good to have five whole loaves of bread because I would not have been able to use them in the kingdom to give each one of you something. The only way those five loaves of bread would be able to be used for communion today is if we begin to break them into pieces and then we could take the pieces and distribute it out. Can I tell you that is exactly what God wants to do in my life and in your life? You will never be able to be used by God until you have been broken. And many people, the reason that they are never used by God is because they're two together. They got it all together. There's a lot of people who came to church this morning that have it all together. I'll tell you that they have it all together. At least they think or perceive they have it all together. Because if I told you, I want everybody in here that's got some problems going on to come up here and we're going to pray with you. 
probably a very small percentage of you would get up and come up. Because many people don't perceive they have any problems. We've got it so together. We have it so together that we don't even really need God. I don't need God for my healing. If I got a headache, I'll just take some ibuprofen. I don't need God for my finances. I've got a job, a good job. Got a retirement, got a 401k. I don't pray for God to pay my electric bill. I got it together. Amen. I got it all together. I have everything that I need. It's what the church of Laodicea said. We're rich. We're full. We've got plenty. And we have need of nothing. We don't need anything. We got it all together. And you know, people fill churches all across America, especially in America. I, listen, I, I, and your pastor and many of you probably have been in countries in third world. I was, we was in it one time and we walked in to this little service and they were all in Haiti and they were all in there just praying and singing and we just walked in. The missionary said, let's just go in there and bless them. We just started taking bags of rice and went in and started blessing them and the missionary came back out and told us, he said, you know what they were in there praying for? They were in there praying for for food and we was able to be able to be the answer to their prayer by bringing food in there and they were praying we never even disturbed them or said anything we just started putting food if they were praying we sat it on their lap if they were standing we sat it on the chair and we left we never talked to anybody we never said anything see in countries like that they are praying for their next meal and they are praying for things to happen in their life but we all have it together and you know what? As long as we think we have it together, we will never be able to be used by God. Huh? As long as we perceive within ourselves that we have it all together, we will never be able to be used by God because God has to have broken people before he can ever use them. I know this isn't a Sunday morning message, but this is my last service, so I'm leaving. Amen? Huh. You have to be broken, and as long as you and I perceive, he said the Laodicean church, he said they say they're rich, they say they got plenty, they have need of nothing, but he said when I look at them, they're miserable and they're naked and they're wretched, and I try to get them to buy real, I try to get them to buy the real stuff. I try to give them eye salve so that they can see it. I try to give them to, to find reality and find things that are real in me, but they're so busy having it all together. Listen, if nothing else, if nothing else, I believe with all my heart that God allowed some of this pandemic and a lot of this stuff to go on in our nation. If nothing else, that it makes us realize how vulnerable we are and how much we really truly need him. Come on, you know something's crazy when the churches and the bars shut down on the same day. It lets us realize how vulnerable we are in our economies. It lets us realize how vulnerable we are in our health. It lets us know how vulnerable we are in our churches. That we can have churches with huge budgets and all kinds of stuff going on. And in one Sunday, the church can be empty. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you with all my heart? I believe that it's exactly what we need. I'm not trying to say, I'm not saying I'm glad for a pandemic, but what we really need is to realize we don't have it all together, that we have to have him so that he can break us and bring us to the point where we need him. Huh. We used to sing that old song. You probably still maybe still sing it. I need him. Oh, I need him. Every hour, I need him. Do you need him this morning? Do you need him this morning? Do you really need him? Come on. Do you, can you look down? Listen, just think about it for a moment. If I would ask you right now, what do you want God to do for you? Some of you would sit here and have to think about it. I'm not sure. I don't really need anything. I don't really need anything. But can I tell you, we do need him. Huh? We need him because our nation is going to hell in a handbasket while we're all sitting around saying we don't need anything. We're saying we don't need anything and more of our 11 to 17 year olds that have ever in history are talking about they want to hurt themselves or kill themselves. That more than has ever been recorded in history in the last 
us two years. And we're sitting around saying we don't need anything. We're saying we don't need anything whenever our communities are so full of opioids and grandparents are raising the kids. You heard your pastor staying up here and talk about it. Our grandkids are, are being raised by, the, by their grandparents because their mom and dad's many cases are so messed up on drugs or they've had their kids taken away from them. And we in the church sit back and we have it all together. We don't need anything. Hello? You know, I thought y'all be shouting more. I'm going somewhere. Stick with me. It will only hurt for a minute. It's like cough syrup. It tastes bad, but it's good for us. Huh. When you ask God to use you, you're not asking him for a suit and tie in a pulpit. Huh. You know what you're asking for? You're asking for God to break you. Because God cannot use what isn't broken. He broke it and blessed it. He broke it and blessed it. When you find somebody that's really blessed, you'll find somebody that's really been broken. When you find somebody that carries a great anointing, you'll find somebody that has been broken. Because the blessing is associated with the brokenness. Hello? It's hard for us to make that connection. Being blessed and being broken. But it's all throughout scripture. In John chapter 15 verse 2. He said every branch in me that bears fruit. He puts a fence around it. That's what I do. Every branch in me that produces fruit. If I find a tree that's producing fruit. We have a little farm, got some cows and some chickens and pigs. And I, down over the hill, I planted a whole little section of fruit trees. Mandy makes fun of me because I caught my orchard. It's, it's not really an orchard. It's only about as big as a stage. Huh. But it, to me, it's my orchard. Huh. And you know what? If, it's, if one of those trees, when they start to produce a little bit of fruit, and I have realized how hard it is to get trees to produce fruit. Huh. I want to guard it. Put a little fence around it. I want to protect it. I want to give a little extra fertilizer and do everything I can because this tree is starting to produce a little bit of fruit. And I think, man, someday I'm going to not get little apples. I'm going to get big apples. But God doesn't do that. It says every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. But every branch that bears fruit, he what? He prunes it. He cuts it back. Why? So it produces more fruit. We talk about multiplication and addition. Am I preaching too long? Am I boring you? Am I too long? We talk about uh, addition and multiplication, but can I tell you that when God blesses you, it comes through a cutting. It comes through subtraction and division, and that is beyond us. But aren't you glad that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts? When God decides to bless you, he'll cut you back. When God decides to bless you, he'll cut you back, and he'll use what you have left to do what? Produce more fruit. Listen, you know that you have potential to be a pr pr productive in the kingdom. That's why you're still here because he said every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. If you're still here today, that means you still have the potential to produce fruit. Come on. Because the devil could have killed you. God could have took you away. He could have cut you off the branch. But if you stomp your foot and say, thank God I'm in church this morning, you still have potential to be productive in the kingdom. But can I tell you that when God sees that you're starting to produce something, he will break you so that he can bless you. Anybody been broken lately? I use the illustration Friday, I'm not going to bore you with it again. But it's the same way with the olives. Olives were the number one ingredient in the uh, holy anointing oil. The only way that you can get the olives is you got to crush them and break them. Through the crushing process, it produces the anointing. It produces the oil. It produces the ointment. Listen, I want to let you know in this church, I believe, I believe this is a message for this church this morning. God wants you and I to be broken so he can bless us. He doesn't want us to feel like we have it all together. 
If you don't ever learn anything from 2020 and 2021, learn that you and I have very little control on what's going on. We have very little control on our stock market. And I know it's hard, it's hard to, to grasp this because we've seen things be so steady and we've seen things that have always worked the way that they've worked a particular way for generations in our nation. But think, you don't have a whole lot of control over your job. You can go in one day and realize, hey, it's shut down, there's lockdown. You don't have a whole lot of control over the price of lumber. Who would have ever thought that you would go to Lowe's and spend $100 for a sheet of plywood? Hello? Listen, let me just be real transparent. You don't even really have a lot of say on whether Walmart has toilet paper in it or not. I mean, you would think these small things would never change. Who would have ever thought you could go buy a used car that would be more expensive than a new car? Who would have ever thought? Listen, it lets us know how volatile life really is. Who would have ever thought you could be out one moment mowing the grass and within 10 days could be in the hospital on a ventilator fighting for your life? Life is short. Life is short. It's volatile and we don't have near as much control over it as we perceive to have. And I believe in realizing that, we would realize how much we really truly need God. Is it possible that God is using some of these things going on in the world to take some of us that have been so put together for years and allow us to break so that he can use us? Amen? Allow us to break. Now look here, this is the good part. I know I've been hitting on you for the last 30 minutes, but I'm coming. I'm going to try to put a little salve on that before I leave. In verse 42, look here. And they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments of fish. After you allow God to break you, he will bless you. And when God blesses you, can I tell you, that he is a God of overflow. He does not just bless you so that you have enough. When God gets finished with you, he blesses until it overflows in your life. If, if you will be willing to allow God to break you, God will bless you and he will supply everything that you need. If, God, if you allow God to break us in this church this morning, you know what he'll do? He'll bless us to the point that it will overflow on our communities. It will overflow in our city streets. It will overflow in our family members. Your kids, your grandkids, grandkids uh, that are lost and on their way to hell wouldn't it be awesome if this morning we were broken to the point that the glory overflowed us uh, and began to have an impact in their lives I don't know I'm just not sure how willing we are to be broken I'm not I'm finished preaching I'm just going to meddle for a couple minutes I'm not sure how willing we are to be broken because we are not geared for being broken. We are geared for winning. We are geared for biting your bottom lip, wipe your tears, suck it up, and get through it. And honestly, in some aspects, we probably could use a little bit more of that. But not when it comes to God. We spend so much time trying to make people think that everything's okay and everything's good. When you ask somebody, how are they doing? Do you really want them to answer you? Have you ever asked somebody how they were doing and they started telling you and you're like, oh my gosh. Most of the time, we don't even expect anybody to tell us how they're doing because we spend so much time shielding ourselves, guarding ourselves, and they can have all hell breaking loose in their life. We say, how are you doing? I'm doing good. And if you're a real Christian on them, you'll say, I'm blessed. 
I'm blessed and highly favored. Yeah, well, how comes all the hell's going on in your life? We're spending so much time. Are we willing to really come to God and say, God, I'm broken. My faith has been hit hard and I need you because I can tell you, do you know when God shows up? He shows up when people need him. He shows up when people need him. And you know what? I think that, let let me just go ahead and say this. I think that in the church in America, we are spending a lot of time trying to come up with a new recipe. When the old recipe works fine, but we just need a refreshing of it. Anybody, you guys, we have a Buffalo Wild Wings here, don't we? We went the other day, Buffalo Wild Wings. I got some wings. I ate them. They were awesome. They were good. Tasted good, had a good flavor. Took them home, put them in the refrigerator. What was left? The next day, I decided I'm going to go out and get some of those wings that were so good last night. Got them out, put the box in the microwave, got them back out, ate them, and they were not near as good as they were the night before. But I didn't call Buffalo Wild Wings and say, hey, you guys need a new recipe. You need a new recipe. I ate these wings yesterday. I brought them home, put them in the refrigerator, stuck them in the microwave, and today they're not near as good as they was yesterday. They say, no, you just need to come back for a fresh batch. Right? And you know, I think that's exactly what the church needs today. It's not that we need a new recipe. It's just that we need it. We've been heating it up and warming it up in the microwave because we're not willing to be broken. I think we ought to get to the altar and we allow ourselves to be broken so that we can have a fresh batch of what has worked for generations. Come on, somebody. He said, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, allow themselves to be broken and seek my face and repent, turn from their wicked ways. Said, then I'll hear them. I'll heal their land. God wants us to overflow. God wants to bless us. God wants to take your not enough and make it more than enough. But think about this. If you don't get anything else from what I said this morning, think about this. The blessing comes from the breaking. If you are in here today and you say, Pastor Mike, I really feel like I'm being broken. Can I tell you the blessing comes from the breaking. If you are not willing to be broken, you will not be able to be blessed. If you want to be used by God, you have got to be willing to be broken because God cannot distribute you and bless you until you are willing to be broken. Stand to your feet. I don't know how y'all usually do things on Sunday morning. But your pastor can fix all this after I leave. (laughs) And he'll do a good job. He'll fix everything I did. But is there anybody here today and you say, you know what? I need God to break me. You'd just be honest. Now there's some people in here, you're already broken. You came to church this morning because you needed something. You say came to church this morning because you got situations in your family, got situations in your body, in your life, and you're already broken. You say, I'm broken. I came here today to be healed. Thank God for that. But is there anybody that you came this morning, and really if you look at your life, you say, you know what? I do think I have it all together. I do think, I, when I look at my life, I really don't see a great big need. That's rarely, that's why I rarely pray, because I really don't need much. You'll be surprised how much you pray when you need something. When you have it all together, you can tell. Your prayer life can be a thermometer to how, how, much, how broken you are. 
if you rarely pray, it's because you don't perceive to need anything many times. Because I found out that when I needed something, I made time to pray. I was praying in the car. I'd get up and walk to the bathroom praying. I'd find, I'd find myself taking a break and just maybe taking a walk and praying. Why? Because I needed something. I needed him to hear me. There was a perpetual feeling of brokenness inside of me. And I said, God, I need you. I feel that way sometimes. I feel that way this morning. I need him. I don't ever want to get to the place in my life where I don't need him. Do you know why many marriages break up? Because husbands and wives don't need each other. They become self-sufficient and they treat each other. They become two independent people that don't need each other. And there's no worse feeling than to feel like you're not needed when it comes to relationship. Can you imagine how God has to feel when so many of his people feel like they don't need him? I know you need him to get saved. Thank God he saves you. But do you need, do you need him? Ever? Do you need him? Do you feel broken today or do you feel like you have all the pieces put together? Pastor Mike, I have it all together. I don't need anything. If you would look around, you would realize we need so much. We need so much. I mean, things are all, I mean, just, my God, think about that. Does that stir us in any bit whatsoever to think that for the first time since they were keeping record that less than half of our country claims to be part of a church? For the first time ever, I mean, we're talking about like in the 80s, it was like 80%. And now it's below half. And we're seeing the results of it. Does it not stir us whatsoever that our young people and our, and our society has become so twisted that people don't even know if they should play on girls sports or boys sports or what bathroom they should go in? That we have become, we have been, and while we're doing that, we're coming to church and we're singing our worship songs and we're shouting and we're hearing our preaching. But yet we sit back like, oh, we don't need anything. That's everybody else needs stuff. I don't need it. Listen, believe it or not, you and I are all part of our community, part of our world. It will impact you. Huh? You don't think it'll impact you, but I promise you, it will have an impact in your life. It'll have an impact in your children's lives. It'll have an impact as society continues to decay and our freedoms are taken away because our society only works with a moral people. As our morals decay in our nation, you will see our freedoms begin to decay with them. Hello? It will have an impact. Can I tell you, whether you and I believe it or not, we need him. I mean, we need him bad because nothing else is going to solve the problem. Nothing else is going to fix it. Nothing else will be the remedy. Not more money, not another plan, not another stimulus, not another president, not another Congress. Nothing else is going to fix the problem. But I can tell you God knows how to fix a problem. I said God knows how. I'm talking about a revival that brings the crime rates down. I'm talking about a revival where you can't get a hit of drugs if you want it. Because all the drug dealers were at the altar on Sunday and got saved. I'm talking about a revival where you can't even get drunk. Because they closed the bars down. Because the bartender got saved. Something that will impact our society. Are you in, is there anybody here today and say, Pastor Mike, I need to be broken. Just lift your hand up. I need to be broken today. I need to be broken today. 
I'm going to ask you just real quick, if it's okay, your pastor's already praying. Is it okay if I if I have them come up this morning? If you if you say, Pastor Mike, I want to be broken, I just want you to come up. There's something about obedience. There's something about stepping out. There's something about hearing God and responding. I want you to get out of your seat, and I want you to come up here right now and say, God, I want you to break me. I want you to break me this morning. I don't want to feel like I have it all together. I, feel, I have felt for years like I had it all together, and I've been doing it on my own power. I've been doing it with my own intellect. I've been doing it with my own abilities. But today, I realize how much I need you. I realize how much I will never be able to be used until I'm willing to be broken. Hallelujah. I'm just going to come and agree and pray with you. Just come on up. Come on up. I don't know if we have any ushers or any men of God that want to help me pray. We'll pray. I just want to agree with some of these people. While you're standing and before I close out this service, I don't know everybody that's here. But I want to ask you before you leave, is everybody here today under the sound of my voice or watching online if we're online? You're where you need to be with God. The Bible talks about there's a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shun. And I want to ask you this morning, have you ever been saved? Say, save, save from what? Save from the judgment of sin. God placed a judgment on sin. It says the man or woman that sins shall surely die or be eternally separated from him. That's what death is biblically. That death does not mean cessation of life or the end of life. There's no such thing. We are all going to live forever. It doesn't matter. Every person here, you are going to live forever. There is a part of you that will never cease to exist. So it's not talking about when you sin that you're surely going to cease to exist. No, it's talking about separation. When you die, your spirit and soul separates from your body. It's separation. Separation, the place of separation is called hell. Because we have all sinned. I've sinned. Every person here, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So because of that, we are all guilty of the judgment of sin. We deserve God's judgment. That would be a horrible story if I ended it right there. But aren't you glad that 2,000 years ago, God sent his son and he loved me so much that he died so I wouldn't have to. He was judged so that I don't have to be. The stripes that were placed upon his back, his beard was pulled, his hair was, was beat, pulled and beaten, nails pierced his hands and feet. That was the judgment of God being placed on him for sin. All sin has to be paid for, and it'll be paid for two ways. Either you can by faith accept what Jesus did to pay for your sin, or someday you have to stand before God on your own. Can I tell you, the Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags in his eyesight. If you try to pay for your sin on your own, you're going to spend eternity separated from God in hell. But it's so easy to say, you know what? I believe that what Jesus did on the cross, Pastor Mike, I believe what you're saying. What Jesus did on the cross is enough to pay for my sin. I'm willing to repent and turn away from this life that I've been living. I've been going my own way. And today I'm going to start going his way. And I want to receive him as my savior. That's what it means. Is there anybody today and you say, Pastor Mike, I have never done that. Or you say, I have done that, but I'm not in the place where I need to be. And I need to make a new commitment this morning. I would not leave this sanctuary this morning without knowing that everything was bet right between you and God. Is there anybody today, and I wouldn't embarrass you for anything in the world. It's not my intention to embarrass you. I just want to pray with you. Is there anybody here, and you say, you know what? I need to be saved. I don't, I'm not where I need to be this morning. And listen, let me tell you this. None come unless his spirit draws you. If you feel that urging, that tugging, that's not me. That's not even you. That's his spirit. You can't get saved just when you want to. His spirit has to draw you and tug you and convict you. And you are not promised that it will ever happen again. 
If you feel that tugging, if you feel that drawing, if you feel that wooing, that is the Holy Spirit. And he's trying to tell you today is the day of salvation. Is there one person that wants to respond and say, Pastor Mike, you're talking to me. I don't want to leave this service today. I want to make sure things are right. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand up and wave it at me and say, will you pray for me? Anybody else? Anybody? Everybody saved this morning. Everybody's on your way to heaven. All right, listen. If you're on your way to heaven and you know it, I want you to lift up both hands and I want you to thank God that you're on your way. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Thank you all for allowing us the awesome privilege to be able to come minister at this church. Amen. I hope that we were as much of a blessing to you guys as you were to us. Amen. Give your pastor a big hand clap. God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, the Lord is good. Been a beautiful start to your day and your week. May God's favor rest on you even in brokenness. May he prosper you through it and out of it and show you your dependence on him now and always. May he keep you safe and healthy today and every day in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. I love you in the Lord. Hug somebody. Let this couple know that you've been blessed by their ministry. We'll see you Wednesday night. Your son.